Welcome to the Philosophy Ames channel. In this episode, we will discuss archive fever, or a critique of philosophy on the internet. All right. So, of course, we have Jacques Derrida and his archive fever. Uh, it's not a very popular text, uh, but it is an important text. And it's fascinating to me how it relates to this idea of philosophy on the Internet. Okay, so why archive fever? Toward a taxonomy of the archive? Four types of philosophy content creators? the differences between the types, and predictions regarding the future of the archive. All right. So Derrida's text, Archive Fever, belongs in the context of Benjamin's work of art in the age of its technological reproducibility and Baudrillard's Simulacra and Simulation. Though Derrida's text can be used to critique Arche, or the search for origins, it also explicitly critiques the manner in which archiving influences the information archived. And so that that's really where my emphasis and my focus is at uh, during this episode. This is, of course exacerbated by the technological mediation of new media. And this is the aspect of Derrida's text to which I was reminded when thinking of philosophy on the internet. I mean, in 1994, uh, I mean, I, I mean, in 1994, I was not aware that the internet existed. I know sometimes when we look at the history of the internet, it says that it was invented or that it came about in 1994, but I was not aware of it in 1994. So certainly there was no YouTube or Instagram or I, I can't even remember what the original uh, search engine was called, InfoSeek or something like that. All right. On page 14 of Archive Fever, Derrida asked, is the psychic apparatus better represented, or is it affected differently by all the technical mechanisms for archivization and for reproduction, for prostheses of so-called lived or live memory, for simulacrums of living things which already are and will increasingly be more refined, complicated, powerful, than the mystic pad, right? And in many ways, he is pointing at and playing with an example used by Sigmund Freud, this idea of the mystic pad. Uh, one of the episodes of the silo recently showed the mystic pad as a, as a relic, um, the little red screen with the, what do they call it? An etching sketch, something like that. Um, so in essence, that's, a, that's what's meant by the mystic pad. Okay. So this passage here calls the form of philosophy on the internet into question. Since the technological mediation affects philosophy's representation. So the question, again, just to sum this up, the question being asked is that does the technology that's involved in producing philosophy on the internet, does it somehow better represent philosophy outside of the internet, um, or does it somehow affect the philosophy in some way? So I think these are excellent questions, and of course the, the answers are, are obvious in my opinion, but, but we're going to talk about them, so, uh, so this is good. All right. From the very beginning, uh, Derrida speaks of the sense in which an archive houses 
that which is archived, and those who oversee the archiving function as guardians. I think that this is this is very important. Um, it is thus in this domiciliation, in this house arrest, that archives take place. The dwelling, this place where they dwell permanently, marks this institutional passage from the private to the public. And this part of Derrida's texts of this of his text highlights the role of the content creators archiving philosophy on the internet. So there's some sets here in which he's saying that the content creators are the guardians of philosophy on the internet. On page 13, Derrida explicitly asks the question of technological archivalization. Freud did not have at his disposal the resources provided today by archival machines, of which one could hardly have dreamed in the first quarter of this century. Do these new archival machines change anything? And of course, that was last century. Uh, but do these archival machines change anything? Uh, of course they do. Of course they do. So the process of selecting, what are the ways in which th these archival machines change uh, philosophy? So the process of selecting and preparing content to be archived, right? The technology influences that process. Hence, uh, the idea of archive fever provides a helpful context for understanding philosophy on the internet. Moreover, the idea of a fever for archiving illuminates something in regard to content creators. So I think that this is relevant on multiple fronts, is, is, is what I'm arguing here. Lastly, it helps us gauge the future of archivalization in the light of artificial intelligence. So, toward a taxonomy of the archive, philosophy on the internet. So a couple distinctions here, uh, but right off the bat, uh, you can see that there is a difference between content creators and event recorders. So I feel as though sometimes these there will be an event that will occur, and that event is recorded, of course, and then made available to the public on the internet. So that is different from what content creators are up to. All right, so four types of content creators. There's those who ramble, there's those who read, there's those who paraphrase, and there's those who think. Now there's two types of event recorders, right? We can see the recording of the presentation of conference papers and the recording of events involving real philosophers. And then here's a kind of last distinction. And I think that this is an important distinction as well. And this is the distinction between those who aim at truth and those who don't care about truth. In this context, I do think that it is worth mentioning that books, in my opinion, are still the gold standard. All right. Now let's take a look at the, at the four types of philosophy content creators. So those who ramble. These are the individuals who evidently believe anything can be turned into philosophy if they just philosophize it. The next category, those who read. These individuals are simply converting books to audio video. Next, those who paraphrase. This is supposed to be teaching without a live audience. And more about this on the next slide. And then lastly, those who think. These individuals explicate and constellate primary sources. This was also one of Derrida's um, let's just say, big ideas that we should respect the philosophical canon and that if you're going to do philosophy, you really need to read primary sources. 
This last category of content creators, it seems to me that this is rare on the internet. I guess you could say also that this part, this idea, let me go back for one moment here, that this idea of explicating also involves categorizing. Okay, so differences between the types. Those who read provide the service of allowing you to listen to philosophy from the writings of a real philosopher. Those who paraphrase need to select what to paraphrase and how to paraphrase it. Unfortunately, this often degrades into cliché and may resemble those who ramble more than those who read. Interestingly, those who paraphrase seem to have a particularly acute case of archive fever. To convert and archive as much as possible. The motor force looks a lot like the kind of worrying associated with overthinking. On the one hand, in regard to this last category here, on the one hand, what makes those who think different from the others is that they have an ironic relation to the archive. They are not seduced by the archive. On the other hand, they understand the proper philosophical context, for example, logical and historical, of the topic about which they are thinking. In this way, they are able to present the topic at a greater depth than superficial paraphrase. This includes being able to connect the topic logically and historically to other topics, but again, not simply in a look-at-how-well-read-I-am way, rather in a way that will benefit the listener when they themselves think about the topic. What about truth? The number one quote on Goodreads for Plato is not actually a quote by Plato. It has tons of likes, but it's not a Plato quote. Uh, I find this all over social media and YouTube. I mean, it was, it was, <laughs> I, 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 I would see this on Instagram so often that I had to just stop looking. I couldn't, I couldn't take it anymore. Um, namely, content creators just make up quotes and then assign them to a philosopher, right? So it's like, you know, I want the world to, uh, you know, give chicken liver treats to cats. So I'm going to go on social media and say, you know, Sigmund Freud said, give chicken liver treats to cats, <laughs> I mean, that, that, that is in essence what's going on. I mean, you know, the, the, the quotes that are being attributed to Plato, I mean, the quotes that are being attributed to Nietzsche, they make Nietzsche sound like a moron, right? Um, I mean, so, but, you know, I, and I, I contacted, I reached out to some of these people. None of them want to interact with me. You know, it's just like, well, I, I, well, I guess it makes sense that they wouldn't want to interact with me. They just want to keep posting quotes about chicken liver treats, um, but I reached out to some of these people and I said, hey, uh, you know, I tried to be diplomatic about it, ecumenical about it. You know, I said, hey, you know, where did you get this translation from? Or, or is it possible for you to tell me where this quote comes from? What what book you got it out of? Because uh, it doesn't, to, to my mind, to my ears, it doesn't really sound like something that Sigmund Freud would have said uh, or, you know. I think I know the passage in Nietzsche that, that you're referring to here, and I have a very different translation of that. Um, could you tell me who translated this for you? And of course, you know, they become hostile. They become aggressive, um, not combative. That would be the incorrect use of the word combative, but, but they do become hostile. Uh, and I recalled the one fella what like went and like tripled down on this he was like I, i'm gonna make the I, you know this will be the the greatest nietzsche channel on instagram you know and i thought based on what you know 
You know, like, we will be the most popular Nietzsche channel on Instagram. Uh, and he even increased how fancy some of his posts were. But in truth, they weren't Nietzsche quotes. So I, I don't really know <laughs> why they're doing that. I don't understand what it's accomplishing for them. What kind of satisfaction or gratification they're getting out of it, I, I can't understand it. But it's it's rampant. It's all over the Internet uh, and social media. So another version of this, some content creators change official translations in any way they like. I, I already mentioned that. There's an extremely popular Nietzsche page uh, that purports to, or, or sorry, an extremely popular page that purports, make sure we get all those P's in there, uh, to be about Nietzsche. However, the majority of the quotes being put out aren't actually by Nietzsche, or they are reworkings of Nietzsche quotes that significantly change the meaning. This this happens more with Sigmund Freud than, than well, it, Sigmund Freud and Nietzsche most often, I think, but I also find it with Plato. Okay. Finally then, in conclusion, predictions regarding the future of the archive. Curriculums for online courses already exist. <laughs> such that once the videos are recorded, the instructor no longer plays an in-the-flesh role in the use of the curriculum to educate. I remember I was teaching at a university where I was my, my, my classroom was being broadcast to another classroom, and as it was being broadcast to another classroom, it was being recorded. And I had to agree to have my likeness to have these videos of me broadcast, but I also had to agree to have them recorded. And as part of the agreement, part of the agreement was that uh, if I allowed my likeness, my my presentation, my lectures to be recorded, then the university would be able to use those images later for its own purposes. And I was, you know, I was a little hesitant in regard to that because my thought was, but 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 this is just par for the course now, right? Uh, but my thought was that, well, then once I record an entire course worth of lectures, they won't need me anymore, <laughs> right? Uh, th they'll just use the videos and then cut cut. You know, that's more profit for them. Just cut me out. Okay, so uh, two quick examples: uh, Udemy and Domestica. And I've I've taken some courses on Udemy and Domestica. I I um I think they're they're good platforms, uh, but it is the question isn't is the platform good? The question is that can the platform function without the professor? And of course, it can. Also, AI voice replication already exists, and this is this is already to such a level that we have seen, for example, figures like Ice Cube um, coming out and threatening, you know, that if anybody makes a rap song with his voice. Uh, that, you know, there's going to be problems, this kind of stuff, right? So, I mean, so so this is already, I mean, that's that happened a while ago now. Uh, so, so we're already in this. Also, AI image construction already exists, for example. In fact, you can go on the internet and uh, create AI images for free. Uh, so, once these pieces are put together, AI can learn from the content already created by humans, technologically reproducing it as its own. The virtual archive guarded by virtual beings accessed through an app by humans who want to learn philosophy. That is my prediction for the future of the archive. Take a look at these images, right? So these are all AI generated images, even the one in the upper right hand corner. I mean, the one in the upper left hand corner as well. I mean, these look, they look like photographs, right? So these were generated by, you can see the individuals here. I don't know if I'm pronouncing her name correctly or if it's even a real individual. It just may be a bot, but Sarah Guerra and Vec Stock. So, so the idea is something like, why can't we just take 
whatever AI-generated avatar you would like. In fact, I suppose, you know, it could be like an RPG video game, and you could just select what avatar you'd like to see, right? Uh, you could also select the voice, like the, like the voice selection on your phone, and some of these voices, you know, can appeal to you in different ways. And then the idea is, is that the curriculum already exists, so the organization of the material and the order through which it is presented and the test questions and quizzes that, you know, function as sort of um, passages to the next level, if you will. I mean, really, it, I mean, it's it's like gamifying, right? So the idea is, is that all of this already exists and... It, it's it's only a matter of time before it just gets put together. I mean, I think that the reason it's not being put together right now uh, is because there's not enough money to be made off of it, right? There's just not enough. There's just not. I mean, it, as popular as these things are, uh, the people who can do it aren't doing it because they feel as though they're not going to profit from that time expenditure, right? So, I mean, they could profit more from that time expenditure in a different area. So I think that that's really what's holding it back at this point in time. But it is my prediction for the future that this is what's going to happen. If you want to talk about fascism, we could talk about fascism. But but really, the the stage will be absolutely set for privatization and there are already apps that exist in the app store that you can uh, pay in order to supposedly learn philosophy. And what they are doing is, in essence, they're reading books to you. So you can see that uh, even though I still think that the one pe- often people who read are doing, a, are doing a better job of being a guardian of philosophy on the Internet than the people who paraphrase, only because paraphrases, you know, they're not understanding what to paraphrase, how to paraphrase it, and they're getting hung up on cliche. It is still the case that uh, what's, it's still the case that it's already available, right? It's already available in the app store for sale. So I think that it's, it's only a matter of time, uh, you know, before somebody gets enough free time on their hands that they're not solely out for profit. And, they'll put these pieces together. And once they put these pieces together, then for these humans, it's it's going to be game over, in my opinion. It really is going to be game over. I mean, you know, what would you rather look at? Well, you could just pick whatever it is that you want to look at, and you could pick exactly how it sounds for you as well. So that is my prediction in regard to philosophy on the internet and the future of the archive.